Welcome to the Wicked Podcast, where we read the business books you don't have the time for. I'm Marcus Kirsch. And I'm Troy Norcross. And we are your co-hosts for the Wicked Podcast. We take from the thousands of business books out there and test the author's ideas by comparing them to real-world challenges. With over 40 years of projects between us, we've got quite a bit to compare against. We give you the condensed takeaways, followed by our interview with the authors. We know you want actions, not theories, and it's actions that we want to help shape, because that's what the Wicked Podcast is all about, helping you to become a wicked company. Hey, Marcus, we're at the end of the week. It's Friday. We've actually got two in the bag this week, which I'm super excited about. Who are we going to talk to today? Yes, so finished the week on a really good one. Um, So uh, we talked to Robert Rowland Smith about one of his books called The Reality Test. And uh, it's quite an amazing book, not just because it's full of really great case examples, but also um, he is a student of philosophers. So he wrote some books on philosophy, and I think it's really interesting to see how he brings these things together. Because I think, you know, what's what's true for us as people is also true for organizations, because newsflash, people are made of organizations. So we had a really good chat about um, how organizations can be closer to reality and less abstract. And uh, But uh, let's start with your takeaways. Yeah, so th- just about him on the book itself. I mean, I thought it was also really interesting that he started off as an academic and then went into management consulting and that has indeed extended to be a, a study of various philosophers. So this man has a, a definite high mark on the curiosity side and, and a hunger for learning, which I always have huge amounts of respect for. Um, as far as, you know, what did I really kind of take away? I mean, he broke the book down into three sections, the market, the enterprise and the individual, and then has these raft of unusual questions, you know, like, will your organization go to heaven? And I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, But overall, we spent a huge amount of time talking about another continuous theme, which is diversity and how diversity brings value to organizations, brings value to innovation. And what I thought was interesting about what he talked about that was it's not just diversity. It's allowing diversity to have a voice that's different than the rest of the organization. So don't say, well, we're going to have all of these diverse people, but if you don't look and sound exactly like us, then we're going to, we're going to exclude you. So that was, that was one of them. The other thing that I found to be was, I'm always a, a big fan of how do we reinvent capitalism and the, the obsessive growth focus, you know, growth of GDP, growth of the business growth at all other costs. And we talked a bit about that. And at the end, his point of view, and I really liked it, was it's not just growth. It's not just profit. It's actual confidence. Can you actually create an environment in the marketplace where people are more confident in you and in your organization? And part of that is through growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think uh, what I liked about it, because, you know, oddly enough, we just had a a great, a great recording this week as well around strategy and pretty pure strategy and a very heavy focus on that. And so, you know, his book is a lot about maybe realizing that strategy tends to be, if you're not careful, be far away from reality and uh, to bring this back. So he, as he said, the questions he has in the book itself are a really great way to rephrase things and remove the abstraction level that strategy and other practices a lot of times bring to the business. So what I really liked about it was that we talked quite a bit about the essence of the business, right? So if we remove all the abstraction from strategy, uh, from silos, from process, remove all that stuff, you actually might finally be able to talk about what you actually want to do as an organization. And therefore, you'll understand the problem you're trying to solve better. You got, you can focus on the problem rather than focus on the process to get there or focus on the budget to get there, right? And I found that really refreshing. I think his book's really great on that one. And generally, the way he talks, and I met him before, that's the clarity of conversation we need today. So I really love that. The second part for me is a bit that that goes home uh, or, or, or hits hits close to home for me as well as as designer and creative. He says, you know, it's it's lovely that we come together with multiple voices and we 
collaboratively approach things. But the whole brainstorming thing is actually not necessarily the right kind of way to go about things because there needs to be balance in where if we want to really change the way we work, if we really want to be able to adopt to today's environment, then we need to do that on an individual level as well. As individuals, go away, take the information we just got from a lot of other people and then come up with something that's further out there. Because otherwise, as you said, as a group, we'll just redefine mainstream. We'll mm. not be able to step out of it because we, 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 we tend to agree, we tend to want to agree with each other a lot. So the social dynamics don't necessarily help innovation, they don't necessarily help problem solving because that's just not how problem solving really works and not a really step change. And I found that quite important when you go, how do we get back to this reality, to this new reality of COVID? Well, it's not just, um, you know, deciding by committee and uh, not the collaborative effort that sometimes service design and some of these new practices actually bring along and say, no, we have to listen all to each other. It's like, yes, it's true. But actually to step into it, into this new map that we have now, into this new reality, we need to have individual thought leaders that step into it and, 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 and are supported by that, which is then a big fight because you, if you buy it by yourself, your de- ideas are hard to be agreed by, by other people because everyone wants to muddy the waters mm. naturally, not, not, not intentionally, you know. So that interesting balance and fight between the individual ideas that are further out there that actually pick up on interesting parts of reality and then groups coming together and sort of ending up in the middle ground again or potentially back to what everyone knows, there's a danger here and an opportunity at the same time. Mm. Uh, tell me again, how did you meet Robert? So, yes, um, uh, very interestingly, I first met him through, because um, he wrote a book on Jacques Derrida and a friend of us, Richard, uh, brought us together to talk about it case being that he knows a lot about Jack Derrida and I know hardly anything about the man. I like some of his principles, but that's about it. So we met we met over dinner and then later we um, met again last year at the House of Beautiful Business, which is a really great alternative business festival, conference. And I he met did in a Lisbon. Con- in Lisbon, Portugal, yes. And he did a constellation um, session, which is one of those tools he's using and doing a lot in his consulting, which is a quite revealing way to organize people in a room and have them think about each other and talk about each other, the way they perceive themselves and feel about themselves. And it sounds potentially hippie, but it's an amazing, it was a very intense, powerful, intimate session on really getting to the, to the, to the crux of a, of a problem. And he does a lot with leadership of companies who tend to sometimes wash over the problems they have and never get, get out to speak beyond politics. And it's an amazingly powerful tool that he does. So the session was, had quite an impact on me. It was very, very interesting well, to, to be in this. So it's fascinating. Well, well done for bringing your connections and back in the, the old days when you could let you go and meet people in person. And who knows, maybe <laughs> we'll get back there again. That's still fun, yeah. <laughs> but uh, for now, shall we go to the interview? Yeah, let's do that. Good morning, everyone. Today, we have Robert Roland Smith here, and we'll talk about one of his many books called The Reality Test. Uh, Good morning, Robert. Hi there, Marcus. Nice to be with you. Yeah, it's been a while, and uh, it's quite an interesting one, not just obviously because your book's interesting, but uh, literally our last recording was a book about strategy that was a lot about strategy and mentioned strategy a lot. And so this time around, um, I was just referring to uh, a quote or a note on the back of your book where it says, no strategy survives contact with reality. Um, And it's sort of an old problem we know. Um, So Robert, please... Maybe we start with, can you tell us a bit how the reality test contributes to strategy and that note of strategy to West contact, uh, no strategy to West contact with reality? But but, but also, what's the origins of the book? How did you you get to writing this book? Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you for both questions. I'll start with the the second one, if that's okay. Um, So I started my professional life as an academic in Oxford and was there altogether for about 13 years, uh, and then went into management consultancy, maybe a strange move in the late 1990s. So um, 
at the time when I began this book, I think it was in 2016 or 15, I'd been a consultant, I guess, for, you know, quite a, quite a while, 15 years or so. And I felt it was time to kind of reflect, I suppose, on the experiences I had had as a consultant. And I think it is very much a kind of consultant's book about clients, you know, because I haven't run a, well, I've run a very, helped to run a very small consultancy business, but I haven't, I've never been the CEO of a large business or a general manager or anything. But one of the advantages, of course, of being a consultant is that you get to see lots and lots of different um, businesses, large and small, public and private sector, voluntary sector as well. And um, within my consulting career, you know, I started off doing some quite technical things like business process re-engineering, but also, you know, ended up doing lots more leadership development, so quite a range. And I suppose I felt that was quite a, or could potentially be interesting to readers because it's um, quite, you know, it's quite a diversity of material. So that was one reason. Second reason was, you know, as an academic, I'd written some books and <laughs> I guess just want to, anyway, I enjoy writing, so I wanted to write another book. And the third, you know, if I'm brutally honest with you, the third reason was to write it as a bit of marketing. <laughs> although, uh, and although the book did, you know, reasonably well, um, I don't think I got a single piece of business from that book until actually last year where I was contacted out of the blue uh, by somebody in San Francisco who'd read it uh, completely by chance. So that's that's the backstory to the book. And the idea behind the reality test is, it, you know, goes back to the, um, you know, consultancy work I was doing and have been doing subsequently, which is that I, I don't think any of the problems that any of the organizations I work with were strategy uh, problems. Um, not really. They were all to do with human issues. They were to do with relationships, misunderstandings, poor communication, cross wires, office politics, uh, people's nose being put out of joint because of a change, union activity, uh, the imposition of a new boss, weird recruitments, uh, and so on. And it felt to me that, well, hang on, this is this is odd. You know, so many businesses go on and on and on about having a strategy and a you know, a kind of rigorously worked out path forward. And although I'm not completely dismissing that, it seemed very striking to me, actually, that nearly all of the issues, but if not 100% of the issues that confronted the organizations that I saw were issues from kind of everyday, real, messy, you know, unforeseen life. So that was the origin of the book. Let's write a book about the reality of what's going on inside businesses in all its strangeness, rather than pretending we can come up with a blueprint for a perfect strategy and that the world will conform to our intentions for it. Yeah, uh, one of my favorite old-time American quotes is uh, when you're talking to somebody who's not very much grounded in, in what's happening around them, you tell them, well, did your reality check bounce? <laughs> You know, because it just it's just one of those things where some people they yeah. ignore the obvious. And I, I found it really interesting how you structured the book as a series of, of questions and then elaborated within each one. Yeah, exactly. And so the you know, the, the book is structured around a set of kind of um they're supposed to be slightly left field questions. So instead of questions like, you know, what's your budget for next year and what's the margin of error you can allow for you know, there are more questions like, you know, will your business go to heaven, uh, for example? Um, would you buy what you sell? Things like this, because um, I guess we're trying, or I was trying to get at the the kind of essence of what it is to be a business or what it is to get uh, gets people to set one up in the first place, you know? Um, yeah, so that that was the origin of it all. I think that's 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 two things you just said just there that really rings rings with me. One is the fact that uh, you know you try to, I think probably get across that abstraction level that exists in every organization about processes and budgets and silos and departments and titles and all this stuff where you go like, and then the second is like back to the essence. Why are you here? Why are you doing what you're doing? Because if you if you're looking back at that, mm -hmm. all that language and nonsense and and um, abstraction level falls yeah. out and i think my experience as well is that you know the bigger the organization gets the more practices you add to it the more abstraction levels you get to the point where you get into some kind of gridlock where it becomes it get it becomes more about 
that than the actual change and adoption resilience or the thing, the problem you're trying to solve. And I think in these days, you know, there's there's a big thing around, there's a big thing around COVID, of course, you know. So now you're, we're talking about, now we have to go back to the essence. Why are we here? Can we still do this or not? Mm-hmm. It's a big, big question. And it seems to, so how, how far do you, do, you, do you see it, how that might seem to get lost in that? You know, when you say, also you, you, you mentioned, is your business a sign of your times? The times have just changed. Mm-hmm. So how can, can we get back to that? Can we, can we look back enough as a business uh, beyond, beyond those abstraction levels? What, what's, what's your view on that? Yeah, thanks. Um, just on your first point about you know, businesses adding layer upon layer until they get caught in their own sort of gridlock, I've seen that a few times, especially with um, uh, kind of FTSE top 10 or top 100 businesses you know, almost by definition, those are businesses which are successful. And especially, you know, if they're PLCs, they will often have quite a lot of uh, kind of group activity, in other words, uh, activity at the center um, of the organization. And that's due to the fact that they can afford to hire lots of people. I mean, it's a simple uh, consequence of being a wealthy business that you can hire more people. But often, those people don't really have enough to do. And uh, the consequence is that the height between different spans isn't great enough. So people are bumping up against one another in terms of roles and responsibilities. They generate work for themselves. They create pet projects and so on. And all of that serves to do exactly what you're saying, Marcus, which is to sort of produce an inner logic of its own. Um, and I'm sure, you know, I'm sure you've come across this as well. You know, a, a lot of large organizations in particular spend more time thinking about themselves than they do thinking about their customers or their stakeholders or or shareholders or or what have you. So yeah, I completely endorse that point. Um, About the sign of the times, you know, there's a lot of, uh, or there has been recently because of the lockdown and COVID, etc. A lot of discussion about, you know, time for a fundamental rethink or a reset, and so on. Um, I'm a little bit skeptical of that because I think the default uh, processes, procedures, and expectations of business and indeed society are powerful. I mean, uh, yes, I, I'm sure there will be some adjustments. We know some businesses will fade away. Uh, we know there'll probably be an adjustment to working life, a balance between home and office, and so on, more remote working, etc. But uh, those to me are not fundamental resets. Those are ways of working resets. You know, the, the, the platform on which everything sits is capitalism. And I don't see that being particularly questioned at the moment, um, except um, marginally, I suppose, through environmental concern about production and consumption. But it, it's inconceivable for me at the moment, at least, that the the belief in production and consumption as the engine of capitalism will seriously be rattled. I mean, it's been dented, but now, of course, we are, you know, governments are very, very keen to get people producing and consuming again, um, because that's the, well, that appears to be the only way that we, that we know. Um, whether you can have a post-capitalist business, uh, I don't know. I mean, the you fundamentally have to go back to the question of, well, one of the questions in my book, actually, one of the questions is how much is enough? Mm. Um, and I think in principle, in capitalism, there is no limit on that. You know, There is never enough. You know, We can always grow more. We can always pay ourselves more. Um, we can always expand more. So um, that would be my answer to that, I suppose, that a huge, massive foundational in so many ways that the experience of COVID has been, it it's not operating at that structural level. It's it's operating operating at a behavioral level for sure, of course. Um, yeah, so so picking up on on that, capitalism is one of the things that I talk about a lot, especially on, on the Wicked podcast with, with Marcus and and even not on the podcast. But I think in the 1970s we had a much more balanced approach to capitalism across the five stakeholder groups which were shareholders, customers, employees, society at large, i.e. taxes, and the environment. And today there is a 100% focus on shareholder value creation, for better or for worse. 
Um, and I think that it's it's a real kind of relentless focus on growth, especially as measured by GDP. And I think you're absolutely right. We're not going to see the fundamental shift and changes at the at the structural level that we need. So it won't be revolutionary change. But I do think, and I agree on that part as well, that evolutionary change in, in ways of working and, and the smaller kind of related edge stuff will, will come to pass. Yeah, that's interesting. I like your five categories there. I think um, another kind of subtle change that's gone on in this uh, intensification, if you like, of capitalism that you're describing is a bias away from profitability as being the most desirable thing in a company towards uh, top line growth. So this is why companies who are, you know, famous companies which are actually failing at a profit level like Uber or some of the Silicon Valley companies that, you know, some of the Elon Musk enterprises and so on, um, can enjoy the confidence of investors um, simply because they are on a growth trajectory. So size, top line uh, activity s seems to have come to dominate you know, profitability. So the you know, top line beats the bottom line at the moment, which I find extraordinary. Um, the only way I can account for it, given the fact that, you know, I was brought up to believe that business isn't successful until it turns a profit. And if you're just kind of spending money, borrowing money and expanding, you know, that's a bad business. Well, I think that model has changed. I agree. Um, yeah. And the only way I can account for it is that it seems that growth per se is the um, driver of confidence. And confidence is actually the most precious commodity in the market. And you know, if you listen to, you know, reports of the FTSE going up and down or whatever it is, or the NASDAQ, you know, what seems to govern that is not actually uh, rational analysis in the end, not that I'm an advocate of purely rational analysis, but confidence. And that, that seems to be the key measure. Are we confident that things will be okay? Well, yeah, if companies are growing, we're confident. It doesn't matter that they're losing money. As long as they're growing, we kind of feel good. Yeah. Emotional versus rational. I know it's a it's a common thread we're hearing. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So let me let me let me tie it back because I think we're definitely talking about <laughs> quite hardcore here about reality for sure. Um, but if I and and it's funny because we here and there always end up talking about this because it's 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 the you know it's the show me the money moment. It's like it always goes back to that eventually in any way that change is supposed to happen it's always the blocker and it also reminds me of uh when we had the podcast with graham who says you know we are i lived under the assumption that there's a more legal basis for short-term stakeholder um benefits to be created but they're not they're not even there it's more like a religion and a mindset that we're living in that is hard to crack and unless it gets cracked nothing else would change but i want to bring this a little bit back into the organization itself because in my experience or, or a lot of things I have to do is still, despite of all of that, do that, go back into an organization and bring change, bring a shift of mindset, uh, bring new ideas in and, you know, plant a new strategy, so to speak. And oftentimes, yes, the money is sort of, you know, uh, where it ends, but at the same time, um, as we just discussed, there are, uh, capitalism has taken it then. There are other voices out there now that have become louder. But how is that translating back into an organization? Does, does, do you actually have a chance inside of an organization these days, despite all of that, to go, you know what, inside of organizations we can grow different voices, different voices should become relevant. And so the relevancy of voices in, in a different one and not just the customer starting to come a bit more into some of the businesses but um the way every worker participates in um problem solving insight finding decision making all of that in order to make companies more flexible and closer to real understand reality better um so what's your view on uh, having different voices inside of an organization because i think you mentioned that somewhere in, the, in, in the, the book as well to talk about voices yeah, I mean, it's it's becoming a commonplace to say that innovation um, increases with diversity. Um, 
that the more diverse voices you have, uh, the more likely you are to generate new ideas and uh, the more robust the decisions uh, will be that you take because uh, there's been a wider variety of viewpoints against which that decision has been judged. So, uh, you know, and it's uh, it's hard to disagree with that, although I'm going <laughs> to disagree with it in a minute. Um, and for a variety of reasons to do with, uh, you know, Me Too, Black Lives Matter, and a kind of long-running diversity agenda, uh, organizations are, you know, just creakingly, slowly getting slightly better at uh, inclusion. But of course, the, um, but you know, and I'm, of course I'm all for that. Um, you know, he said conscious that here we have three middle-aged men talking to one another on a, on a podcast. Exactly. But, um, I um, have a couple of caveats about that. Even when you include um, uh, non-mainstream voices, once you're included, there is a pressure to belong within that organization, which we all, anybody would feel. Because as human beings, not only do we like to belong, but we also fear very much being excluded. And that's probably one of our most sort of fundamental um, and emotional uh, building blocks, I suppose. So you can include diversity, but the pressure to, to, to belong will always to some degree mitigate that diversity because uh, even apparently diverse voices will, and we all do this almost unconsciously, will seek out what it is, uh, what must be said in order to secure that belonging in any given group and how to behave in order to secure that belonging in any group. You know, we, we run a risk by being diverse of sacrificing our belonging. So, you know, belonging versus diversity, I think, is a, uh, a challenge. So, and organizations, I mean, if I'm going to be a little bit cynical about it, um, you know, I remember when I was a tutor in Oxford, you know, a lecturer, and I, I would run seminars and tutorials and so on. One of the colleges I had a lectureship at, um, and I was teaching English literature, in the in the, one of the year groups, we admitted, uh, I think we admitted 10 students a year to read English, roughly. One year we admitted, and they were, you know, as you can imagine, 90% of them were, you know, people like me, so white, middle class, uh, privately educated, and so on. One year we admitted one uh, African American uh, girl, woman, young woman from London who ended up leaving after a year because she she just felt she couldn't fit in. And um, my experience of that was we liked it when she uh, kind of spoke like us and thought like us, but was different from us. It made us feel good. But whenever she sort of said things that were a bit sort of clearly not of the dominant culture, it was a bit like, hmm, not quite sure how to process this. How does it fit in? You know, it slows down the discourse or it interrupts it in some way. So, um, I, yeah, that's what I would say here, that, that you know, we obviously need diverse voices, but actually the organize, organizations have to be ready to uh, kind of radically tolerate that difference. I mean, you know, I'm a, a written philosophy books there's a philosopher i like called uh, jacques derrida and his kind of logic on this would be um if you want to include the other to use the philosophical term i.e somebody non-mainstream then you can include the other in order to belong in the mainstream that you've already created which is one thing and that's essentially assimilation but unless you are prepared for the other to come in and change, disrupt the organization entirely, then it's not a genuine welcome. To welcome the other, you've got to be able to welcome the radically other. In other words, the other that is so different, it changes who you are. He says only then, really, are you dealing with proper, kind of, he wouldn't use this term, but only then are you dealing with proper diversity. Even to the point, and he talks about this in terms of guests, 
and hosts, you know, only when you're prepared to welcome into your home an enemy who might remove you and even do you in, only then are you being radically hospitable. Until that point, you are bringing the other into your home under conditions which say, generally speaking, you've got to conform, you've got to belong in the way that I want you to belong to this organisation or this home, even though you're different. Yeah, because, you know, what is hospitality if it's not the openness to the enemy? You know, if you're just having your friends over, that's, you're really not opening anything. You know, you're just working on a continuum from where you are. So that, you know, that that's what a proper inclusion would be. It's an inclusion which carries with it the risk that you yourself will be excluded. Or, or but, but, but is it is it black and white, or are there degrees, shades sure. of grey? Yeah, I'm absolutely. Of course, there are, there are shades of grey. Um, I think really what all I'm saying is that the the pressure, the desire, the need to belong uh, is so strong that it can can very easily overtake or overcome the um, you know the the, the well intentioned desire for diversity and different voices in organisations. I think that for me goes apart from to commitment. Also, um, it's it's funny you mentioned Derrida because I think we both met through Richard because of that because I had an interest in him, didn't know anything about it. And you obviously know a lot about him. I think, you know, having having things really phrased like that is absolutely powerful because I think it also goes back to the essence of, you know, why we're all here. Why, why, why do we organize in such large groups in order trying to tackle big things? Because we commit to some, some higher goal, some bigger goal that is bigger than uh, the individual self. And therefore... Yes, we have to step in and sort of commit to quite some extent, not unlike a relationship, right? It is a relationship, of course, but let's say not unlike a romantic relationship. Um, but you, you really get into that. And it's interesting to see from my perspective, coming from a service design background, there's a big, big emphasis on empathy. So empathy is the thing that as well is sort of really hard to get into, into businesses um, because they're so quantitative. And, but in essence, all it says, like, just listen to someone, just listen to who's in front of you in trying to understand what's really going on and try to understand more of how they feel and what they do. And when you just mentioned, you know, when you really invite someone into your home, let's see what, let's see what happens. Let's see what changes and, you know, expect everything and they expect everything also goes into, into that. So what do you think to, again, I think we're probably still talking about the same thing too from a different angle or with different words describing the same situation so what do you reckon how how do organizations then really break this do they really have to be on their last legs to ever have a chance or do we rather have rather have to rebuild them because that's that's another argument right you either can grow change from the inside or you just build the next thing Till the old one falls over. What's what's your view on that? Well, there's a couple of things I'd like to pick up on there, if it's okay, Marcus. First of all, sure. um, you know, use the word listening. For me, there are um, two modes of listening. One I'd call active, and one I'd call passive. So even in this conversation now, I'm guilty of this. You may be guilty of this as well. Um, I'm doing some passive listening and some more active listening. Now, by passive listening, what I mean is you're talking and I'm listening to you, but even as I'm listening to you, I'm also listening to the thoughts in my own head about what I'm going to say next, right? So my mind is half filled with my my thoughts, even while you're talking, and half filled with your thoughts, okay? So that's kind of, I'm doing a mixture of active and passive listening. Um, and I my experience of a lot of business meetings is that most of the listening is passive listening in the sense that when somebody's talking, the people around the room don't have empty minds that are filling up with the words of the person speaking. Their minds are pretty much full with their own thoughts, what they'd like to say next, what meeting they're going to go to next, what they're going to have for lunch, and so on. 
So for me, um, active listening is about emptying or having your head empty and fill solely with the words of somebody else. And that's, I think, where voice becomes multiplied in a way, when the voice, where one person's voice is the only thing being heard in another person's mind. And that, for me, is the origin of change, uh, really. Um, can I can I give you an example that happened to me 27 years ago? <laughs> yeah, my, my friend Caroline Bowman, um, at seven years old, she went on a, on a journey on a flight, and she had an ear infection. And she went from hearing to non-hearing. And so she could no longer hear. But she had had the ability to hear previous, earlier, before she was seven. And we were sitting at the pub one day having this conversation. And we were talking about exactly this, the active listening, waiting for the pause in the conversation with what you're going to say next, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And she said, I can't do that. I'm reading your lips. I am intensely focused on exactly what you're going to say. And she said, my big revelation is if I sit and actively listen long enough, rather than trying to interrupt, I may listen long enough that I come around and I agree with you as opposed to just kind of figuring out what I'm going to say next. So I, I don't practice it perfectly, but what Caroline gave me in that gift, you know, 27 years ago, still lists, still lasts. I love that story. Isn't that nice? Um, and it also suggests that passive listening is essentially an act of resistance. I mean, in the psychoanalytic sense, you know, because you're resisting the other person uh, whereas that kind of more active listening that you're describing there with your friend is one in which that resistance gradually erodes and uh, fades away, and then you can come into alignment with some somebody else. Um, sorry, Marcus, I know this is a bit of a digression from your question, but I'd like to just go back to, to one thing, if that's all, all right with you about... Um, yeah, that's totally fine. Can I just add one quick one to that? Because I had a thought while you were saying, while you, yeah. while you guys were talking about this. For me, it's even more than that. So A, it reminds me of when we had the podcast with Jeff Colvin about constant learning. He talked a lot about, you know, instead of being active as an athlete or doing what you're doing or practicing your own thing, step back and look at what you've just done and, or listen or, you know, observe what's just going on or what just happened which for me is a similar to, you know, like a listening activity. The other part, even more, is there's this beautiful um, uh, uh, um, segment in a, in a video from my favorite skater, Rodney Mullen, who's probably the most innovative modern skater at this point. He, um, he said the way he learns, so that brings it again back to learning, is, you know, he, he does something, takes it all apart, tries to forget as much as he can everything he knows and then steps into something new. And for me, that's the same thing, right? So when you, when you listen to someone completely, you really do active listening. You are not there anymore. And I've also remembered that because I've done that um, a few years back, funny enough, of all places, House of Beautiful Business, where we met last year, Robert, in Portugal, that one in Barcelona, I think it was one of their first ones. We did a session of active listening in a room with about 20 people. And the fascinating thing was that it's so energy intensive. I got a headache afterwards. Some people had to tap out because they couldn't concentrate because no one's used to doing this. As you said, it rarely happens in, in meetings. People are not prepared. People are not trained to forget about themselves, fully listen and actually take new things in because I bet it's one of the whole B brain things that you know, learns new things. You have to tap into that. And we go with the A-brain, what we know, we throw it out without thinking, without learning. That's most of our state. So I wanted to throw this in as a note. For me, it's nearly not just listening. It's actually, that's what constant learning looks like, right? Yeah, I like that. And it, uh, your A-brain and B-brain reminds me of the system one and system two um, idea. And from, I don't know if you know that. From Kahneman. Yeah, yeah Kahneman. Sorry, I call it A and B. I yeah. mix up my theories all over the place. <laughs> um, I want to just to go back mm -hmm. a couple of steps, if that's all right. Um, Please, yes. This thing about diversity and inclusion, and and this um, the kind of accepted wisdom of our day is that you are more innovative the more diverse the group of people is. But my experience of this. Um, particularly watching the dreaded brainstorm is that um, 
brainstorming rarely produces anything new. What, what, so, for example, if you had a brainstorm today of people, what it would do would be rather than create something new, it would, it would recreate the zeitgeist. So, you know, somebody will mention Zoom, somebody will mention COVID, somebody will mention coronavirus, somebody will mention digital, somebody will say the word viral in both senses. You know, what that is, is not a pr- production of the new, but a recreation of the present. And that's what, in my experience, most brainstorming is, because people find it very hard, actually, to you need a kind of radical imagination to think about the future. I can't think of a single thing I've heard about the future over the past six months during lockdown, which hasn't been an extrapolation from the present. You know, it's just, oh, we'll have more office working or more, you know, uh, more homeworking, you know. Um, so for me, whatever the pr- the future is, and history keeps telling us this lesson, it's not an extrapolation of the present. <laughs> it's different from that. Anyway, um, uh, when I think about creativity, and I think about that in the creative arts, you know, if you think about particularly painters, but not just painters, you know, a lot of those people have been uh, lone figures whose creativity has derived from being solitary and allowing their own unconscious processes to unfold and taking the risk of bringing that unconscious material to the surface. Now, I don't know, first, maybe it's an obvious example. You know, if you think of Picasso, at first he's ridiculed because that that kind of deeper material looks ridiculous. It's non-conformist. It doesn't belong. So when I talk about not belonging, for me, creativity is the risk of not belonging uh, because it's going out on an edge. It's saying, I'm weird, I'm different. I'm serving up to you material which is inappropriate, hasn't been pre-approved, it's uncensored, it's unlicensed, it, it's probably unwanted. But it is new and it's different. It may even be grotesque. And that's what uh, novelty or innov- innovation consists in. And for that to happen actually requires people not to be in that social space of the brainstorm. And fundamentally, I think a brainstorm is a social space, which is, like for me, exactly the wrong space for creativity. Creativity doesn't come from in a social space. It comes in a inner space, an unconscious space. It comes in dreams, imagination. It comes in strange moments, acts of repetition or compulsion that all of us are prone to. And that those conditions are ones which organizations find it terribly difficult to, to create or to foster or, or to allow to happen because again, because they're taking a risk, you know, what will be the return on this thing if we have this, you know, maverick person thinking weird things? You know, what's going to happen? I mean, organizations try it, don't they? You know, and they put in their bean bags and their ping pong tables. <laughs> like, okay, well, if we give everybody, you know, free beer and whatever, they'll be all the more creative. What you're actually doing there is you're producing another culture of belonging. You are not stimulating, the, for me, what I would call the more idiosyncratic or idiomatic processes of of uh, generative creativity which is which is risky you know um i think well, sorry go on I, I think that's that's you know having sort of grown up as a designer and creative person or you know doing in so hopefully some innovative stuff um i think i can absolutely relate because i went through my life in the shift between you start out as a as a designer or as a creative person with ideas and you find yourself in this really lone spot and people looking at you going like, tell us, what's the idea, you know? And then you have to fight for it. And you often talk about stuff that's never been measured. So no one has any idea, if it, as you said, if it's going to work or not. And you're pretty much lonely there in your, uh, in, in, in your position. And as if the, the argument between where do great ideas come from? Do we need soul leaders or thought leaders to just go and do it and challenges with it or the brainstorm i've been in the same and and unfortunately you're right i'd love us to be able to come together as a group and be quite progressive but that doesn't seem to work because it always gets muddied up the more people you put in a room and then you have to sign off process on top of it so it's really tricky to do so and i think 
it's it's yeah it's it's a really odd paradox because some things we can only solve together and at the same time we want to dissolve this myth of like oh it, it's all is only up to one person and that one person is going to make it successful or that one technology is going to make it successful that's not really true either right so i don't i don't know i i'm i'm just speaking out loud here a little bit because i'm i'm it's i find this a bit of a paradox as much as both parts are needed if that makes sense Hmm. I don't know. It's just sort of the thing to say. I've been through the same thing. You're absolutely right. I absolutely agree. Um, so again, it's sort of what's the solution? Do we still have to have these soul fighters in organizations that are getting grounded down and some will survive and eventually bring us forward? Well, I don't think it has to be a dilemma or a paradox. And I'm thinking of um, probably the most successful leadership program that I can remember being involved in um, I can't name the client, but it was in collaboration with uh, Oxford Said Business School. We took these uh, leaders, I think there was 30 of them approximately, on a retreat. And um, I mean, our solution to this dilemma was to have a process where both were allowed. So, we, you know, there was essentially a group process at the beginning to um, understand where we are now and have a you know very kind of honest conversation about that but the middle part of the process the middle part of that week was a sort of radical solitude you know where people were off on their own having very uh, kind of profound coaching and therapeutic conversations not mixing with one another um, but then gradually resurfacing and bringing their learning back back together in smaller groups and then the larger group. So, um, you know, maybe there's a kind of process answer to your question or a kind of design answer to your question, which is you, you can do both as long as the sequencing of it is right and as long as you are allowing both the group activity and the solitary activity to be as um, pure, I suppose, as they can be. Um, yeah, and I remember that was uh, extremely successful, not just in terms of how people felt at the end of the week. Because as you know, I mean, I'm sure you've done this, you've been on leadership programs and what have you, where by the end, everybody's in love with one another, you know. <laughs> uh, but then, you know, a couple of weeks later, it's, oh, what was that? Right. Um, it's very hard to maintain that momentum. But in that particular case, it did seem to feed back into some important change in the um, in the organization later on. So I, I want to pick up on another word that you use in the book. And so if we start with, you know, inclusivity and diversity and then innovation and then the challenges that are brought on with the ideas of belonging, I'm going to throw in this horrible word called tribalism, you know, and the fact that we've got tribalism going on in identity politics, we've got tribalism going on in, in all kinds of different things. How can organizations recognize tribalism you know, and then kind of how can they best deal with tribalism? Yeah, that's such, such a good question. And and how an organization can become a tribe by itself uh, as well. I mean, certain organizations are tribes in the sense that, uh, well, I think of the, um, this is a much used example, of course, but you think of the army, but certainly the British army, at least, from what, from the little I know, of the of the British Army, you know, there is a strong sense of the tribe for the army as a whole, as well as the tribes within that. You know, the I might get the language wrong here, but you know, the regiments, the platoons, the battalions, whatever they are, and and that's quite an extraordinary example because the um, you know, like a Russian doll, it kind of it's all consistent. You know, it works. The tribe works at a smaller level and a and a larger level. Um. I had a conversation with, um, I, I did some work with um, uh, the World Economic Forum. I do a kind of regular thing with them. And I remember being with, um, I can't remember his name now, but one of the kind of key people involved in it, maybe even the founder. And he was talking not about tribalism, but about networking. And he was basically teasing people who have more than 500 LinkedIn contacts. <laughs> You know, I mean, I, I'm i now back on LinkedIn, although I did delete it a couple of years ago because I hated it so much. And I, um, 
kind of kick myself for feeling proud of having more than 500 contacts. You know, you reach that threshold, 500 plus, it's like, oh, wow, what a dude he is. You know, he's got 500 plus contacts. But of course, it's completely meaningless. And this man was saying, you know, it's impossible to manage 500 contacts. The absolute maximum any of us can have or should have in a network is 150 people. Beyond that, you can't can't manage it. And within that 150, you should have categories. You know, why are you in contact with this person? You know, what's it for? Is it to get a job, is it to keep in touch? Is it because you fancy that person? You know, whatever. Um, and I think there must be something about um, the size. Of, I guess what I'm getting at here is what, what the size of a tribe can be. I think I'm right in saying that Gore, the f- company who created Gore-Tex, capped the size of any business unit to about 70, or at least I remember reading that, whether it's true or not, on the grounds that uh, 70 was the only kind of workable size of tribe you could belong to, because it, you can you can uh, just you can know everybody in a group of 70, not well necessarily, but it's it's kind of manageable. So I think the size of tribe uh, is important uh, for me. Um, just on identity politics, um, I think the, I mean, this is obviously a massive issue, a uh, whole separate subject. But for me, identity, you know, again, I'll take a philosophical view on this. My identity is simply that which allows me to be identified. You know, so it's, I think it's mistakenly taken to mean something more profound than that uh, these days. You know, I identify as this, that, or the other. Okay, well, you identify as this, that, or the other. You know, that's a classification. It's a way in which you become identified. Um, But it's not necessarily getting at anything real or true about you. Um, And, um, you know, many of the kind of identities, even the kind of extreme identities, well, unusual identities adopted today, carry with them a kind of, illiberal liberalism it's like you know we can be let's be woke enough to tolerate these more marginal or more unusual identities but you know if somebody says something vaguely conservative or belonging to the old world we don't allow that so it you know you mentioned the word paradox um marcus for me you know identity is caught up now so much with what I would call this illiberal liberalism. Like we're we're so liberal that we welcome and tolerate all sorts of exceptions, but we're not liberal enough to accept anything mainstream. And in fact, not just not accept it, but uh, exclude it. Um, So it's a a strange form of, um, again, exclusionary inclusion. Interesting um, perspective. Yeah, I didn't really answer the question about tribes and organisations, but that's um, that's that's quite all right. I think we've got time for for about one more. So I'm gonna I'm gonna swing us way back to the beginning of the conversation. Um, and you were talking about the fact that the reality test of the book hasn't done much for for incrementing uh, driving incremental revenue for you. But <laughs> I have to say, the the number of cases that you've worked on, you know, clients, projects, you know, consultancies, etc., makes the book incredibly rich. And my assertion is that in most of those cases, the organization was self-aware enough, or the decision maker was self-aware enough to know that something was broken. Um, a lot of organizations are in this, you know, uh, state of denial. You know, they say that denial is more than a river in Egypt. And we, we, need, we need to find a way to help organizations break out of this denial and recognize what's holding them back. Are there any particular interesting techniques or strategies that you kind of work with organizations and say, yeah, all right, you think everything's right, but have you thought about X? Um, this, this may be um, an unfamiliar practice to, to, uh, to you guys, I don't know, and maybe to the people who listen to this. But I use a, a lot now, my main technology or technique that I use is this thing called Constellations, um, which is based in um, systemic therapy. So I use it in a, in a therapeutic context with kind of individuals and families and so on. 
Yeah, remember Porto. I was in one over in Portugal, right? Right in the middle there. Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Exactly. So, Marcus, you've, yeah. you're, you're aware of this. Anyway, um, without going into detail about that, it's a process for surfacing hidden dynamics in organizations. And often those hidden dynamics actually are to do with people who've been excluded, as well as um, business from the past that hasn't been dealt with, whether that's um, you know a redundancy program that wasn't handled well, some fraud, a scandal. I mean, I recently was working with a, a major... Um, I can't say who it is, but I'll just say financial services institution um, who want to focus on a new, uh, you know, new way forward. And, you know, I, and I was working with some others, suggested that actually, okay, well, it's good also to look back before you look forward and, you know, learn lessons and all of that. And Let's think about where you've come from and this your corporate history, which stretch, stretches back a long way. So they they produced this corporate history in a timeline and talked about it, but with a glaring omission uh, where a huge scandal that had affected them in the past was simply glossed over. I mean, they, they literally edited it out because it was a source of continuing shame or embarrassment, what have you. And that, for me, is uh, disastrous. You know, because by suppressing the past, you create a ghost, basically. Um, and the only way to get around that is to to bring it into view and to look at it. So that that would be my kind of short answer to the, the question. Yeah, it's okay. There's this specific technique, constellations. I think there are probably other ways of getting at the same thing. It's I I would suggest you know looking in the corners, and particularly looking backwards. Or which often can help, um, and you can you can, and I think I say this in a couple of case studies in the book. You know, organisations that keep repeating patterns because their focus, you know, is always on the future. I, you know, speaking of business books, God knows how many business books have the future in the title. You know, it's it's, it's I find it. I mean, I understand why, of course. You know, businesses are generally speaking future oriented entities. But you can't have a good future without having a good past in the sense of uh, a a good past in the sense of a well understood past or a dealt with past or a worked through past. Because otherwise, that past will kind of throw a loop around the future and around your legs and, um, you know, trip you over. And it sounds Uh, like that's related to (laughs) one of your later chapters in the book called Which Lies Are Acceptable. Yeah, you know, exactly. and and I I really really appreciated that. But I think we're at the the end of our time today. Marcus, did you want to ask one last question or, or wrap up? Yeah, I think I just want to comment because um, I've obviously been in so I, as I mentioned, I've been in the constellation that um, session that Robert ran over in Portugal, and uh, it's quite an interesting tool. Let's call it that or process. And um, uh, to the point, as as you said, Robert, or mentioned, or maybe the listeners can gather from this there's a lot of stuff that comes out of that that you're not allowed to talk about outside of it because it's quite powerful it, it it can open up a lot of things so it's quite really on the very very powerful side if you look at all the tools that one can have in order to actually bring reality in and and crack it open and and you know digest hope eventually digest it but i think in the beginning it's a lot about um actually bringing things to the surface that people rarely seem to talk about or be able to talk about. That goes both to talking about and listening to, right? Because when I was in there, a lot of it is about you standing in a room, everyone stands in different places based on certain relationships, and a lot of things come out based on where you where you are and how you feel. So it's, 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 it was an amazing experience to be in, quite intense, um, very intense for some people. Um, um, and uh, it's 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 a really interesting one. Um, I I definitely want to learn a bit more about because I think I had a bit of, couple of questions to you afterwards, but uh, I think you had to rush off unfortunately to 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 catch a flight. Um, yeah, and so I think to wrap this up, maybe you know it's interesting. It's great. We talked about so many things. There's so many more things in the book. As Troy was saying, it's amazing how many examples from reality you have in there, and to show. I think what I like most as well is sort of 
you phrase it in different questions. You ask the, 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 the questions differently that by nature make things a bit closer to reality rather than the abstract of most other books. So therefore, in a much shorter version, uh, thank you for your time, Robert. It was an amazing conversation, as usual, I would say. Uh, and thank you for your time and uh, your insights. Thanks very much, guys. It's a, it's a pleasure talking to you both. You've been listening to The Wicked Podcast with co-host Marcus Kirsch and me, Troy Norcross. Please subscribe on Podomatic, iTunes, or Spotify. You can find all relevant links in the show notes. Please tell us your thoughts in the comment section and let us know about any books for future episodes. You can also get in touch with us directly on Twitter on at Wicked and Beyond or at Troy underscore Norcross. Also, learn more about the Wicked Company book and the Wicked Company project at wickedcompany.com. 